the rest of the major cities, not only in the UK, but also around <coughs> Europe. So this is the second one. Uh, and uh, I hope that from <coughs> this day's uh, presentations, you get a sense of feeling that open EHR has arrived, that it uh, is used in real projects. Uh, we don't want to spend too much time talking about the technology and the, uh, the concepts. We'll do a little bit of that a little bit about the future in the end, but mostly it's about use cases. It's about customers using this technology uh, and the products associated to change healthcare. And uh, since we're running a little bit behind, I will just introduce my co-chair at the Open EHR Foundation, uh, Ian McNichol, who will be speaking this afternoon, and Joan Hoxma, who will be giving us a few words in the beginning about the uh, UK healthcare and why it needs disruption, I guess. Thank you. Uh, can you just give him the microphone? I'll just keep it brief. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think about 50% of people here I know, and the other 50, Eamon Nicholl, I'm a former Scottish GP, as you'll gather from the accent, but haven't been in practice for many years, fell in, into bad company with uh, the Open EHR crowd about 10, 15 years ago, and rose to the exalted ranks of co chair alongside, uh, alongside Tomaj. Um, as Tamash said, I think in the UK there is definitely a sense that this is now real. It's happening. You know, there are real projects, real products you'll, you'll hear about today here and in Europe. Uh, and it's an exciting time, so I hope you enjoy the day. Thanks, Ian. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm John Hugsma. I'm the editor of Digital Health. Um, formerly, we were known as eHealth Insider up to three years ago. Um, Basically, though, we specialize in coverage of IT and UK healthcare, digital health. Basically, if it's got an IT or information component, um, we cover it. We've been doing this for quite a while, about 15 years um, since just before the National Programme for IT began. Probably the question I get asked most often over the years is, why is it so bloody hard? Why is the adoption of um, technology, the digitization of healthcare, in all its myriad complexity, so painfully slow? Why is it so stop-start? And over the years, I've, I've had a kind of stock kind of um, selection of answers that I give people, and, and they run something like as follows. It's complicated. It's really heavily regulated. You've got an incredibly difficult um, end-user community because they're so highly educated and opinionated. Um, it's the politicians. The politicians are idiots. They start things, they run it for a couple of years, and then they lose interest or they don't see it through. Um, it's the money. OK, the NHS is particularly skinned to the moment, but the NHS being broke is a permanent condition, and it has. Um, and I'd argue, actually, that it's not true. The NHS is £120 billion a year broke, permanently. Um, its problem, I think, in terms of how it thinks about kind of IT budgets, is it thinks about IT as some slice on top of that rather than the whole budget. Um, there's other reasons. It's highly regulated, standards, um, suppliers. Everybody likes to kind of knock the suppliers, and oftentimes a very good reason. Um, and all of these are true to an extent. But I think there's also a truth that we have the... Um, IT market and the suppliers that we have chosen. These are the suppliers we have bought from. Um, the problems that we have in terms of lack of interoperability, um, in terms of lock-in to system vendors, exist because people keep buying the same bloody systems from the same suppliers. They don't choose a different alternative. Now, I understand that there's plenty of reasons why that's the case. It's damn difficult to switch from your current situation. So we run the CCO and CIO networks. Um, I think one of the other kind of features that um, has been encouraging over recent years is that I think there is a greater willingness to, um, to share uh, best practice for people to try and, um, and copy what has worked elsewhere in the system. Um, back to that kind of question of why is it so difficult, is I think there's been historically a reluctance to actually kind of scale up things that work. And, um, you know, the old line about the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed, applies particularly kind of um, 
within kind of healthcare IT. Um, so as a journalist, we, we kind of, I particularly like to think I've got my finger um, reasonably on the pulse and you're kind of alive to what's going to be the next trend. Um, back in September, I went up to Salford almost as a last minute thing um, to the kind of open EHR um, event which was run there. Um, and I had my eyes open. Um, open um, air was something that I'd been aware of and following with some interest for quite a few years. Um, you know, putting it in the same category as open source and open standards. Generally, digital health to be, tries to be quite supportive of and, and provide coverage of, of these developments. But at Salford, I came away from the day's presentation struck by things are shifting. The ground is moving. There was a beginnings of a groundswell of organizations that were going beyond kicking the tires, going to meetings. Obviously, everyone likes going to meetings. Um, and actually beginning to put some of um, this into practice. There were enough open EHR uh, projects that you could consider at the beginnings of a movement. The fact that one of the GDEs, um, Salford, was actually kind of um, beginning to explore bimodal development using kind of um, open air. Uh, the fact that a trust Plymouth had actually signed a contract, finally, to, um, to kind of um, deploy some Moran stuff. Um, and in particular, I think the one that really struck me was the number of kind of trusts that had a, just a slice of um, open air through the kind of Genomics England programs meant that we were at the beginning of, of a shift change, I think. Um, and that shift change being that people were willing to at least try. So it's early days. Um, I think in terms of you think about sort of tidal forces, um, we're still at the high water mark of the big proprietary mega suites in the UK market. You know, the GDE program and another push over the top with Cerner and Epic and all scripts. It's, you know, it's the end, I think, of, of that kind of um, that wave, but we're not kind of at the point where that's receding yet. Um, you know, GDEs will only benefit about 20% of trust. There is, in effect, no real answer to all the rest of the trust in the country. Fast followers is essentially telling trust, you know, manana if you're lucky. But, you know, the experience of kind of dealing with HM Treasury is if you're not front of the queue when the money's been handed out, forget it. You know, if you're third or fourth down the line, go and find something else to do. And I think where open air is, is particularly important to um, NHS trusts, um, is that 80%, the kind of have-nots, those that are not in that golden circle of GDEs. And frankly, even the GDEs, the sorts of sort of sums of money um, are relatively trivial in terms of the challenges they have at hand. And it only deals with a limited part of what they need to do. So we have a great lineup of presentations. It's lovely to be kind of um, sort of saying a few words at a conference where I haven't had to spend weeks and weeks sorting out a conference program. So well done, those that have done that. Um, and next up, we have um, Tomas um, Gornick, the CEO of Morand. Um, I had the pleasure to speak to Tomas over dinner last night, who's going to tell us about the postmodern EHR. Tomas, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, so um, I thought I'd just set the stage for, for the presentations that will follow in a, in a way that tries to explain the concept behind some of this thinking. So um, I'm the co-chair of the Open EHR Foundation and I'm also the co-founder of Maran, the company that is trying to build on this vision, uh, mainly build tools and uh, platforms to enable Open EHR to flourish and run in uh, healthcare environments. But I always start with this slide because it kind of summarizes how we see that healthcare is changing. In particular, as these changes require change in applications and software. So if we have today firmly at the center of this slide clinicians and patients at the same location doing typical healthcare services, Anywhere we move along these axes, we are disrupting healthcare. And for the purpose of today, we need to think about the software that will enable these changes. Of course, change always brings new opportunities, new business models, and 
people who are building new software need to think about how they can take advantage of these new business models. And there are many. Uh, but it's not like unlike things we've seen in other industries. Uh, this is an example from the computing industry where 100 years ago we had a very personal computer called the slide rule. Because of the cost of technology, everything shifted to the center. We had big mainframe computers, computing centers, which were able to afford the technology. But then things started coming back to the user, where today, through, through the path of mini computers, micro computers, we again have a personal computer in our pocket. And healthcare is no different. We had a very personal physician come to our home 100 years ago. Then everything shifted to the big hospitals. They had the money to buy the equipment that was required for care of those days. But with economies of scale and with the advance of technology, things are getting cheaper so that we can actually, through health centers, even retail clinics, and back to the personal computer, have healthcare in our pocket. So it's exactly the same trend that is fueled by the economies of scale and the advances of technology that is driving healthcare as well. So the examples are abundant. I'd just like to point out a few uh, retail companies going into healthcare. Uh, I think they're exaggerating a little bit by being wanting to be number one, but the goals are big, definitely, and a lot of the other retailers are following suit. We have things like virtual care, where the largest HMO in the US with 15 million patients claims that 50% of their interactions are done virtually. That's huge numbers. And this is only recent. This is in the last two, three years that this shift has happened. We have things like this. This one is particularly funny to me because it's people competing for ER based on the wait time that is published on billboards. Uh, it's a US example, of course. Uh, but we also have a lot of activity, uh, mergers and acquisitions. And the question you have to ask yourself is not only what this does to your applications, but above all, what does this do to your data? What happens when somebody, your vendor is acquired and you are pushed to migrate 12, 15 hospitals to another application? And this is what's happening. Uh, and these are big deals. I mean, these, this is the Siemens uh, uh, Cerner or the McKesson all scripts or there's uh, Noema Life, more pertinent in Europe, uh, the HP stuff in Spain that is now being uh, bought, that was bought by CSC. These are big changes, and big changes are not very conducive to keeping your data for the lifetime of the patient, because all of these applications keep data in proprietary formats, and we'll talk about this uh, going forward. So new players, new business models, we believe that platforms and standards are the way to mitigate this risk. And open data, open API is a concept which is basically what we are pushing at the OpenEHR Foundation, and hopefully with the help of an ecosystem of partners. So I don't even need to do, use these slides anymore because a lot, of, a lot of people, especially you guys here, understand what is needed uh, in the application space. It's basically the same type of applications that you use at home in your daily life. You as a caregiver would like to use in the office caring for patients. The patients on the other side want to be participant, a, a, a larger participant in the care process, meaning they want to share their own data. They want to be sure that the, the clinician dealing with them has access to all the relevant data to make the right decision. Um, and, of course, they want to keep this data private, but also accurate. So the current systems uh, are very lacking. And this goes for the whole industry. I don't think there is, uh, there's better and worse, but all in all, most of them suffer from these uh, uh, problems. Quality of data, difficult implementation, uh, high cost, lack of interoperability. All of these are serious issues which affect the solutions that we're using today in healthcare. So I've, about three years ago, I started comparing this to other industries. And one of the industries that is particularly interesting is the ERP industry. So think about this. Three years ago, if you went to Gartner looking for an ERP solution, they would say, go out and buy SAP. 
Oracle Financials. The thing is, they're not saying this anymore. Uh, actually, two years ago, they published this. And what they're saying is that the traditional systems were built for the needs of the past. And they're also saying that they can't cope with the requirements of the digital era in especially responding to what they call business moments, which are much faster pace of business enabled by digitalization. So this is the ERP industry, right? But this is Gartner saying that the mega suite will not cope with the demands. So what we're trying to prove is that healthcare is slower, but is no different. And that the same trend is coming to healthcare, maybe with a five to seven year uh, delay. But we're almost in those four years after, after they started saying this. And the way they explained it is that we used to connect systems peer-to-peer -peer or um, basically point-to-point, -point, not peer-to-peer. -peer. Best of breed connected through integration, high cost, relatively low uh, level of in interoperability. But that's how we were working in the 90s. Because of the backlash, the mega suite came. Pre-integrated, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, integration and the costs involved. You put in the mega suite, and that's it. But what Gartner is now saying is that the future, and this is what they call the postmodern ERP, and I have just basically used that term uh, for the postmodern EHR. What they're saying is the core shrinks and the innovation happens around that core. And the best example I have is that if you're a CRM user using SAP, you are more than likely to switch over to Salesforce. Even though you have CRM and SAP, you actually cross it out. You start using Salesforce. Workday is another example. There's a lot of examples in the other spaces. So we believe that healthcare has to follow the same path if it wants to do the run the business part, which is done by the core, but also be open to innovation. So there's a fundamental difference between ERP and healthcare, and that is the data. The data in healthcare is much, much more, uh, uh, has to be much more long-lived, uh, and of course it's much more complex. And people coming from other industries, we, we were in telco for a long time, are always amazed about how much more difficult it actually is. But this type of architecture basically allows for the bimodal approach where you have the reliable uh, run the business type of applications and teams actually, and also the agile, the, the new stuff, the patient facing stuff in this case, the devices, uh, uh, all the things that are really hard to do in an existing system without huge cost. So coming to healthcare, we all recognize this architecture as something that is running in most Care, care organizations. It's basically a core system, and then you have the labs and the radiology and the pharmacy and maybe the ICU. And they're somehow, in best cases, connected with an IHE-based uh, HIE, Health Information Exchange. So what we don't realize is that hospitals also have a lot of other systems. Now, Andy just walked in from Plymouth. Uh, they have about 170. And I think that's actually quite good because hospitals claim they have 500 or even thousands. So it's not even these are the, that are the problem, but there's also ones that we don't even know about. So think about the GDPR coming in May. How are you going to work in this architecture if you don't even know which applications you have, let alone which data on which patients they are storing? But that's not the only problem. The problem is that these applications appear for a reason. There's a requirement that somebody in some department has. They go to their IT department. The IT department says, we'll talk to the vendor. The vendor comes back with either a huge number or a two-year cycle. And it doesn't solve the problem. So this head of department goes out and builds their own application. Usually not a very good application, but it solves the problem. It's a lot of times even innovative. Okay. So how do we get from something like this to something that is sustainable, organized, and actually can comply with the GDPR directive. So the idea that we are promoting and calling the postmodern EHR is that you actually start with one application, one application that will solve one of your problems, but at the same time enable an infrastructure that can move you forward. 
So you'll be hearing today from Plymouth where that application is e-prescribing. It's one thing that they really need. They would have done this anyway. So why not do it in a way that will allow them to move the rest of the applications in due time? Okay? It's not a big bang replacement of what they have. It's actually solving the immediate problem, but then setting an infrastructure that can gradually move the other applications across. And this is what we call the postmodern EHR. So the proponents, I mean, the, the components are multi-vendor. Uh, they could come in different deployment models. They can take advantage of the new technology because they are basically new applications. But the main thing is they work in this bimodal world where you keep the old stuff running. It's a real pain to replace an existing uh, PaaS or, uh, or even uh, an EHR. So let's talk about the data, the stuff that's different between the EHR and the ERP world. So applications in any industry keep data in proprietary formats. The problem, as I said before, in healthcare is that we need to keep this for the lifetime of the patient. So in the ERP world, five-year-old data, you put it in the data warehouse, you're reporting, it's fine. In the EHR world, you need to keep it active and accessible for the lifetime of the patient. So what does that mean? There is no application that lasts 100 years. Even if you have the best, you will be migrating every 15, 20 years, depending on how much money you have, from one system to another. And even between the vendor upgrades, the same vendor, you have a migration. So a lot of times, this is so costly, you just forget about the old data. That's, that's what ends up happening. So what is curious is that in healthcare, we've actually solved this problem for images 20 years ago. Uh, the DICOM format is a standard, and nobody today would put an image in a different format. So CDA or even PDF is a vendor-neutral format for documents. But the structured data is still kept in those silos. And that's what we're working on at OpenEHR, putting the structured data in a vendor-neutral format and decoupling it from applications. So the architecture that we get is something like this, where we have uh, a service bus, but we have the three types of data, images, documents, and structured data, in a format that doesn't depend on any one of the applications. And this means that the applications using these APIs can be from different vendors. So just recently, this year, Gartner also recognized that this is the way forward. And they actually clearly stated that it is not enough to exchange data in open formats between applications in healthcare. You actually have to persist it in an open format. And they specifically mentioned VNA, which is the imaging, open EHR for structured data, and XDS for documents. And this is a really important paper for us because up to now, as I said before, the idea was buy the mega suite, don't worry about this stuff. Now they're saying, actually, if you want to move forward, effective and sustainable architectures will require vendor neutral storage of data. So this brings us to OpenEHR. And since the whole session and the whole day is about OpenEHR, I thought uh, in, in Manchester I did this at the end, but I don't think it, it made much sense because some people still uh, uh, maybe are struggling with what OpenEHR is. OpenEHR is basically a set of specifications uh, to define an e-health platform which is based on these concepts we were talking about. It has several features which make it really, really useful for dealing with healthcare data. Uh, and one of the prime ones is that it separates the content from the technology, meaning that the models the data models are built by clinicians, and the software is built by IT people. Now, you would think that's obvious, but think about the applications that you have. A lot of them were either coded by clinicians or the data models were built by IT people. Uh, that's how most applications are built. And we believe that's fundamentally wrong. And OpenEHR has tools to make it easy for clinicians to define the models and for the software people to use those definitions. So the data that is stored in OpenEHR is basically of four types. So the observations, 
everything you learn about the patient, what the patient tells you, what past results, family history, and so on tell you. The evaluation, where somebody makes a decision based on this data and a knowledge base, uh, things like diagnoses, things like um, what procedures to do, assessments, so on. Based on this, they issue orders. They're called instructions in open EHR, like uh, medication order, lab order, and so on. And then these actions are carried out by the staff. And this circle, of course, continues as the care process uh, evolves. So this is an example of a data model. Uh, it's a simple one, one of the simpler ones for blood pressure. Uh, but what you immediately notice is that we're not storing just systolic, diastolic. And the reason is that in order to interpret the data, you actually need to understand the context of this data. So most systems would store systolic, diastolic, send it over to another uh, user. And if the user is not aware whether the patient was under exertion, whether he was sleeping, what the, uh, sometimes the position of the patient was, they cannot interpret this data it's actually quite dangerous. In open EHR, what we do is we store all the data with the context as well. We also use this to do translations, different languages. We use the model to set um, um, uh, criteria to validate the data. We use the model to bind this to terminologies like SNOMED and LOINC. The important thing is this is all done before a single line of code is written, okay? Um, and since all of this information is in the model, it enables us to build applications much quicker. So the archetypes, as they are called, are assembled together to form something called templates. And this is the two-level modeling concept. The archetype is universal. The blood pressure over there can be used anywhere in the world for any type of blood pressure that can be measured, whether it's from a home device, an ICU application, GP cardiologist encounter, or so on. But of course, it has to be adapted to the use case, and this is what the template does. It uses the same archetypes, but presents them in a different way and groups them in a different way so that the template can align itself with the use case. So the form that is built on top of the template takes only the data that is actually needed for this use case. And this means, like I said before, however we get the blood pressure, home device, cardiologist encounter, GP visit, it's always stored the same way, but it's presented to the application differently based on what is needed. So what this also means is that all the levels of the architecture understand data the same way. Now again, this is something that people think is, is uh, obvious, but in most applications that's not the case. We have a relational model underneath, we have an object model at the server level, we have another object model at the client level, uh, and this creates confusion. Here, all the validation, binding to terminologies, translations, and even the data structures can flow through the whole application from database to the GUI. The second thing that this does, it creates, the, the, it, it solves the problem of the right people defining the right things. So if you think about the standards bodies, they are the ones that have to define the archetypes and the terminologies. Then we have governments, regions that are trying to build a system for that area that can define some templates, like you would want the discharge template to be the same in a country, hopefully, or at least a city. But then the vendors can add their own templates based on the use case, based on what is needed by their users and the application. And after they do all this, they can actually use tools to generate some code, build some of the rest, use the APIs, build the application. But what is ensured, because these arrows all point in the same direction, is that whatever you do here, you can still query the basic archetype in the same way. This also brings portability to queries. So different applications, if they store data using the same archetypes, can use the same queries, which is very important. Think about clinical decision support applications. There's a presentation today about that. It's not difficult to write the rules. The difficult part is binding to data. So if you can bind to the model, the same model, regardless of which application produced the data, 
that's very, very efficient. So the second paper by Gartner also uh, recommends to CIOs to finally look at OpenEHR um, as a means of providing a universally consistent and semantically operable, interoperable clinical data model. So this is important stuff, especially for the trusts, because um, in most uh, industries, including healthcare, Gartner is uh, a really important uh, uh, provider of, uh, of uh, consulting. So we'll just touch on this uh, here, but in the afternoon we'll talk about what is the future for OpenEHR. And we're trying to tackle something that was today solved by flowcharts, which is how do you do guidelines? How do you talk about process? And what we found is that a much better analogy is to use the navigation system. Think about this. If you do a flowchart for a birth scenario, what happens when um, uh, the, um, the mother has uh, diabetes? What happens if it's twins? What happens if there's a genetic mutation? It all affects the flowchart in ways that are impossible to manage. Now with personalization, genomics, we're getting even more variants into that idea. So we believe the right idea is to use something like navigation. Think about Google Maps. You set a, tar a target, a goal. You know where you are. It calculates three, four paths to that based on criteria. But then even when you take a wrong turn, it just recalculates. And I think this is much closer to how healthcare works. Because you get ba a bad lab result, the guideline goes out the window, right? You have to change course. And I think this analogy uh, is exactly what is needed. And uh, Thomas will talk in the afternoon about how we're doing this. Uh, so to summarize, um, OpenEHR gives us the, the possibility of all layers of software understanding data in the same way. Reusable queries, uh, tie-ins to terminology, uh, and in the future, clinical workflow. So I'll just finish with some use cases, and I'll skip the ones which you'll be hearing about during the next talks. But OpenEHR is definitely gaining ground, with notable exception of the US, but that's a story for lunch, maybe. Uh, so um, we have now countries actually committing to OpenEHR. Brazil is one. India was just announced about a year ago. Uh, Norway is doing a lot of stuff. You'll be hearing about this stuff during the day. Uh, we have pretty large systems one of the largest is probably the city of Moscow. Uh, they were presenting in, in uh, Manchester, but uh, uh, even the NHS is waking up to this. So, uh, and I think these events are evidence of that. Uh, Germany with Heidelberg and a number of the other universities. Uh, but it's not just that. It's, it's all across the world. Uh, and some of these cases are really, really interesting and really powerful, meaning big. But I summarize the use cases into these five uh, areas. Uh, EHR systems, the, the basic. I mentioned Moscow. It's 12 million people, a shared care record for the whole city. Uh, but it's not exchanging data as much as they have built the applications on top of an open EHR platform for all of primary care and are about to do the same for 106 hospitals. This gives them huge flexibility in how they build out the next applications because they have a stable data platform underneath. Uh, they're doing some impressive stuff with analytics, uh, managed to get waiting times down to 48 hours for most uh, appointments, uh, and also not having anybody wait more than 20 minutes after their allotted time, which for what they had before is major. Um, this is where we started, uh, the Clinical Center of Ljubljana uh, Children's Hospital, using the e-prescribing solution, managed to achieve stage six. And this is the first hospital in the world on an open platform that's achieved stage six uh, MRAM score. Uh, and this was done basically to prove that this type of technology can get you to stage six. And if they had the money to buy all the equipment, they would be stage seven. Uh, the Philippines, the primary care provider, they're rolling out to 200 primary care centers that they're building. Uh, we'll hear about Patient Sky from Oslo today. Uh, this is the EHR, the EHR uh, use case. 
The CDR for government, as we call them. This is shared care records, uh, e-health programs. Uh, we have the country of Slovenia, sorry, uh, running uh, uh, about uh, 90 providers, uh, sending their discharge letters, uh, care summaries, uh, immunization records, uh, e-prescribing, e-referrals to a centralized uh, database based on open EHR and using this to build new registries. Uh, we'll, we'll hear about the person held uh, record from Leeds uh, this morning. So that's the second use case. The third one is research. Uh, and it was mentioned this morning, uh, the Genomics England project, which is now spreading to 17 university hospitals. Uh, and it's a, f a part of the 100,000 genomes project. Again, uh, John is going to speak about this, so I won't spend time. Uh, clinical registries. We have the European Registry for uh, uh, Transplant Patients Matching Donors and Recipients in the, in the Netherlands, uh, but for 12 countries of Europe. Uh, we have a presentation on that. Uh, and finally, the ecosystems. And John mentioned uh, the Royal Salford example, and I'll just let Rachel tell you about. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I would like to reflect on some of the work that we're doing at the moment and some of the challenges of being a CIO over in the UK. So uh, one of the big challenges for us is innovating around our EPR. So we are one of the most digitally mature trusts at Salford in the UK. But actually, uh, the data model within the EPR can't particularly deal with some of the innovations that we want to do. So the wearables, the um, Internet of Things, the uh, apps that we've got. And so we really want a platform that we can use to actually extend the data model for the applications that we want. We also find as well that the interoperability as well back into an EPR is not there yet. And we need a layer where we can actually create those innovations. So if you look at the Gartner model with the, the Ninja and the Samurai, really, you know, we've got a really stable, solid EPR at the center, all scripts in our case. Um, but around that, we want to be able to innovate the data model, the user experience, and so on, especially for the citizen, but also for clinicians as well. And so there's small tests of change that we do as well um, within our um, quality improvement methodology. We need a platform that will allow us to actually put a digital intervention in uh, that can sit alongside our EPR and be, you know, uh, ingested by our EPR, but doesn't mean that we have to go out to our EPR vendor to do a, a 12 or 18 month development cycle just to test something and so that's one of the biggest challenges we've got um, and I think that we've got a, a, a pretty neat way of dealing with that uh, as well as we can at the moment but for the future I think the sustainability of healthcare is really down to us leveraging those citizen interventions and citizen self-care and self-manage and so uh, we're really gonna have to get our heads around how we actually uh, put those solutions out for the citizen and make them appealing, usable and safe. Um, and so for me, that's the question that we've been asking as one of the global digital exemplars. Um, a very interesting project we just started with the largest uh, lab automation company in the world, Impeco. They're OEM by Siemens and Abbott and they do the uh, most of the large labs, including Quest and so on in the, West, in, in the, in the US, uh, they are thinking about how they could offer this directly to the patient using a personal uh, health record based on open EHR. Uh, Medtronic, we'll hear from Atiz later, uh, a patient engagement solution uh, called Get Ready. Um, so the examples are all over the place. Uh, obviously, uh, they're not only in the UK, some of the larger ones are outside and uh, our mission is to bring these examples here uh, to talk about them and to see how the UK can also move forward using these examples. So to summarize, uh, I tried to show you a little bit how healthcare is changing, how we believe that the monolithic systems can't cope with this change and how the example of the ERP where they went from best of breed to modern to post to mega suite to postmodern is coming to healthcare as well. Uh, this makes the future multi-vendor, uh, and in the multi-vendor environment, of course, vendor-neutral data is a key asset. And hopefully, we'll give you a glimpse today how the OpenEHR initiative provides a proven platform to make this happen. Thank you. Uh, and Thomas, we're running actually to time. Have we got time? Yeah, just we got a time quick for couple of questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Who's got a question they'd like to kind of put to Tomas at the front here? Oh, it is, it is. It, that's just, uh, um, um, how do you call the, the image? It's, uh, it's a mind map, right? So that's not the XML that comes out in the end. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I mean, ideally you would like to code it with terminologies, make it semantically interoperable. And uh, uh, it's actually just as difficult a problem to code the same as it is to structure the same. So this is a serious issue which we all are fighting every day. Uh, think about the lab systems, you know. Uh, in most countries, everybody uses different codes for labs. So I don't think there's much disagreement in the simple stuff, but with things like labs, with things like, um, you know, things that physicians do a lot and are used to a certain terminology, there's a big effort to move them over. Otherwise, you have to cross map. So there's many ways to solve this, and uh, maybe we can talk about this in the afternoon where we talk about tools. It doesn't have its own terminal. Well, it has all the, of course, the That's units. But uh, I think Ian will talk about this in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A couple of quick f further questions. Anyone else like to ask a question of Tomash at this point? I mean, I'm, a, I'm here all day, so we can, we can discuss during the breaks. Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up, we have um, John Creed, who's the um, CEO of Patient Sky. Um, a Englishman um, transforming um, Norway's um, primary care EPR market and a lot more beside. Um, John. Thank you. Just, let's see. Just plug it in there. USB for this. 